Welcome to the E-Success Methods Podcast with Jacob and Aaron, your weekly dose of tips and tricks to achieve excellent performance in your business and career. Join us as we explore deeper into the practical worlds of Lean, Six Sigma, project management, and design thinking. In this episode number 190A, we kick off the holidays with a rebroadcast of Stave 1 of the audio release of A Business Carol. To get the full commercial-free version for free, fill out the form at esuccess-methods.com slash book releases or email me, Aaron, A-A-R-O-N, at esuccess-methods.com and I'll send you a link to download all eight audio files. For now, please enjoy Stave 1. If you like this episode, be sure to click the like link in the show notes. It's easy. Just tap our logo, click, and you're done. Tap, click, done. Here we go. A Business Carol by Anwar El Homsi and Dennis Alamina, narrated by Aaron Spearin. Preface We are at an exciting point in our evolution as a social species. Never before have we been more connected or more autonomous. We've built a massively interdependent infrastructure that allows us extreme independence. Today, we live on a battlefront between the old ways and the new. The clear lines that bounded and insulated the money elite, the corporations, the government agencies, and even countries have blurred and are becoming more porous each day. Historically influential organizations and investors are beginning to feel the nip of the newly empowered at their heels. New authority is gathering around leaders who see a better future where providing goods and services no longer justifies trampling through communities and ecosystems like gluttonous drunkards taking what they want with barely a wink toward the regulators whose campaign coffers are stuffed full of free speech. This is our Christmas card to the globe, our small battle cry to inspire those idling in the bleachers to come down and jump into the fray. This is not a call to arms in the battle of blood and bullets. Instead, it's an invitation into the mud wrestling of wills and ideas. Because... In the chaos of unbridled minds shoving passionately against other minds untethered lay the potential for our greatest human achievements and our brightest future. Onward. Stave 1. My Father's Tale. It was that time of year again, Christmas Eve. Everyone had gone home early, leaving just Dave and me to man the fort. I'm not married, and my family lives far away by design so I didn't mind at all. It gave me a chance to catch up, maybe even get a little bit ahead on my latest project, something I was especially keen on because it had been circulating on the office grapevine that I was under consideration for promotion to senior VP. I was deep in concentration, crafting a justification for a funding request when my IM chirped, You still here? I hated to respond to that, but Dave was only around the corner as directions go in cubicle land. I could hear him pounding on his keyboard from my desk. Dave is nice enough, but talking to him is never a predictable event. Right now, I really wanted predictably short so I could finish explaining how three new admins for my team were vital to prevent the end of all life as we know it. Anytime you ask your management for money, it's always good to oversell. He's probably just making sure he's not alone. I click the I am. Yep, I'm still here. Not even a minute later... I heard feet slapping down the hallway. Slap, slap, slap. How did his feet manage to survive that abuse from year to year? Soon, a goofy-looking, round, freckled face, topped by graying red hair with that, went as willy-nilly as its progenitor poked over the top of my cubicle wall. Still here? My physical presence should have made that question rhetorical. But you never know with Dave. If I stayed silent long enough, maybe he'd think I'd already gone home. He brightened. I wanted to ask you something. Rats. He'd seen right through my non-responsive stealth mode. Dave swung around the end of my cubicle wall, never breaking eye contact. God, how I hate tall people. Strictly under the bro code, if you will. If you will. His favorite phrase, and it annoys me to no end when anyone uses it. What does it even mean? If I respond, I certainly will not. Would you leave me alone? The odds are against it. Unable to force a positive response, and my tongue idled by grandmother's admonition that, if you can't say something nice, then say nothing at all, I stared blankly, wishing anything would pull him away before I'd completely forgotten how civilization was about to end. 
Don't mind if Dave takes a seat with you? Without waiting for a reply, he wriggled his large frame into my purposefully tiny guest chair. He leaned in with a huge grin, fully anticipating quality bonding time. How was that again? Deadlines would be missed. Clients may react with violent displeasure. The soul of my dearly departed grandmother held my tongue from shooing him away on Christmas Eve. Dave looked around the room to ensure privacy. The fact of the matter is, he looked around again for good measure, then slyly lowered his voice and leaned closer. Dave has a problem, if you will. There it was, a trifecta of annoyance. I'd long gotten past looking around when he started talking about himself in third person. But the fact of the matter is, if there was an award for best verbal fluffer, Dave would be in the running, if you will. Oh, just please spit it out. Where was I again? Violent displeasure. Department of Defense customers. Dave shifted excitedly. Today, if you will. Dave was talking to Linda. You know Linda, right? Linda, the department secretary, is a sweet woman in her mid-thirties who is currently completely distracted at work thanks to impending nuptials with her partner of nearly ten years. Yes? Linda got mad at Dave, if you will. And may I say, for no apparent reason at all. He glanced around again. Now Dave needs ideas for how to smooth it over. I cannot say that I was expecting that. Exactly what was happening when she got mad? Nothing. Nothing at all. Dave leaned back in the chair, genuine bewilderment on his face. Maybe, if you will, it's the stress of the wedding? He raised an eyebrow, anticipating my agreement. Her wedding? Yeah, yeah. I think that was it. He leaned back even farther, testing the metal of the tiny chair, his head nodding, waiting for me to confirm his beliefs. When that didn't happen, he leaned in again. All Dave did was ask which one of them is the man. She turned really red, slammed a book, and stormed out. With that, he straightened up within. I know, really strange, huh? Sort of look on his face. Dave. I leaned in to emphasize my next point. Wouldn't having one of them be a man defeat the whole purpose of a lesbian wedding? Well, Dave was stumped. His eyes narrowed as he absently studied a folder on my desk. Then he looked at me and inhaled deeply as he squared himself with a jerk. That's it! What's it? I know what I'll do. I'll get them a card and write in it. That's okay. You can both be the man in my book. I would have stopped him, honestly, had it not been for my grandmother's soul sitting on my very being. If you can't say something nice, I'd had enough. My concentration was shot, and I didn't care to provide editorial input on Dave's card. I packed some work folders and my notebook into my bag and headed home. Traffic was light, owing to the holiday. Most were already long home and in the midst of Christmas Eve traditions. I barely managed more than a grunt in response to old Miss Etzel's cheery holiday greeting in our apartment building lobby. I pulled my mail from the little box and stepped onto the elevator that still stood open from Miss Etzel's trip. Thumbing through the stack of mail, there was a Christmas card. The burgundy envelope was a soft linen embossed with dainty golden holly leaves. It was addressed to my apartment, but to the name Abu Saad El Homzi. Odd, the address was correct, but I don't know anyone who would be called Abu Saad at least not since my grandfather died, well over twenty years ago. I ran a finger over the ornate hand calligraphy. How would I find this person to deliver his card? I let myself into the apartment, dropped the mail on the counter, and put water on for tea. By the time I'd changed into a favorite pair of sweats from my alma mater, the water was ready. I made up a tea tray and carried it to the end table in the living room. Then, remote control in hand, a fresh cup of tea at my elbow, I sunk into my pleasantly overstuffed couch and thought, Anwar is very, very tired. Each year I watch the old Christmas classics. I root for Rudolph. Who doesn't love when they all cheer for Rudolph at the end? I cringe for the Grinch's poor dog, Max, struggling to avoid destruction as that huge sled races down the mountain toward Whoville. Then there's George and Clarence in A Wonderful Life. I grin when George finds Zuzu's petals, in his pocket. And later, when Zuzu smiles and says, Every time a bell rings, an angel gets their wings. 
I think. Way to go, Clarence. Way to go. Tonight, a Christmas carol was on deck. You mean know it as Scrooge? That one always throws me into a quandary. Intellectually, I understand how society expects me to react to Charles Dickens' indictment of the nascent capitalism. He's bad Scrooge at the beginning, and becomes good Scrooge by the end. Classic hero's quest stuff, right? But realistically, update bad Scrooge's office, give him a nice luxury car, and throw in a reasonably sized cubicle for Bob Cratchit, he'd have no problem fitting in with today's fraternity of executives. It doesn't take much to imagine bad Scrooge in a power lunch at the local tavern commiserating with co-workers. They'd bemoan how high taxes are because all those takers are too damn lazy to work and pay their own taxes. And don't get 21st century Scrooge started on regulations. What good does clean air and clean water do for anyone when there are no jobs? People on unemployment lines don't care about polar bears when they can't feed their families. And don't forget those people who don't want to give up their iPhones, yet get their knickers in a twist because they're made by workers earning $2 per hour. At least those workers understand the value of steady work and don't complain. Then, as Scrooge and his companions charge their lunches to corporate accounts and reach for their antacids, they'd head back to their 12th floor coal mines, where they claim the very soul is being sucked from their life as they toil away hoping for that big break when they'll finally start living the good life. I say this not as a critical outside observer, but as one who was on track for that brass ring. I was certainly no Dave, bumbling through life, oblivious to even the basic decencies to be afforded others. Yes, I dare say that bad Scrooge would be considered a success in today's world. His dedication to cost containment would be admired. In some ways, it's almost like Dickens' Ghost Trilogy ruined a perfectly good capitalist. As I sat there, only half watching the show, I began to wonder how a modern-day Dickens might write the story. Would he still write about an individual, or about a corporation, or maybe even about the government bureaucracies, choking off all the good that capitalism has done to the world? I must have still been pondering those questions when I dozed off. That's the only explanation I have for what followed. To believe anything else would call my sanity into question, and jeopardize my continued and now sometimes tenuous, grip on that same sanity. I first remember rousing slightly to a soft hissing sound. No, not quite hissing, it was white noise, like static from a radio, with no transmission signal. At that point, either I became more fully conscious, or the sound grew more insistent. I opened my eyes to see frenetic tiny black specks filling the 65-inch HDTV screen in front of me, Outside, a milky fog, tinged yellow by the sodium streetlights, crowded at my oversized living room window. Tiny ice crystal flicks of light swirling against the glass. The e world was oddly S silent, Methods as Brought if all sound had e been absorbed S into the Industries. energy of the white Join room. us on our website at www.e6s-methods.com. Journey through success. Hey, Jacob, you remember when you used to work for me? Sure. Do you happen to remember how much money you were making back then? Yeah, I do. Yeah? And yeah. how much more you're making right now? I can do the math. And uh, how about that development plan that you and I put together during that time? Definitely gave me some perspective and gave me some direction on what I need to focus on. I found that useful. So far, I have a 100% promotion success rate for those people who are willing to work hard and were willing to work with me to create a customized career development plan, the E6S Pro Career Program. Three different levels promotion and pathfinding level, which is career planning, customized improvement plans, resume refinement, and interview preparation. The next level down is targeted for those people who are they're just looking to prepare for their next move. And because it really does pain me to see unemployed professionals, I am offering a level called Help Quick, a free one-time resume review and revision for those who are unemployed and in the Lean Six Sigma quality engineering project management or science fields. So for anybody who wants more details and information, these can be found at www.e6s-methods.com slash pro career. And if you're serious about career advancement, contact me through the website. You'll be glad you did. I can watch for that. I don't know how long I sat mesmerized and oddly stilled by this large display before the sound in the hallway registered in my conscious mind. Something heavy, being drugged in short bursts down the carpeted corridor. The sound grew louder. 
heavy chains being lifted and allowed to drop back to the carpet with each step. Part of me screamed, run! But the rest remained entranced by the snowy pattern. My body didn't respond. Then something began to occasionally hit low on the wall on my side of the hallway. How could I know that it was my side of the hallway? Whatever it was, it was now only one apartment down. The chains now scraped the wall between each heavy stud. Probably just old Miss Hetzel returning with some sort of Christmas present for her grandkids. Scrape. I really should go help her. Scrape. Thump. Nah. Sounds like she's making steady progress. Scrape. Who am I to interfere? Thump. I'm going to feel like such a sissy when I find out that it really was just poor old Miss Etzel. I sat there, stewing in my cowardice and paralyzed by the dancing dots. The scrape hit my door. A metallic noise rang through the apartment. Run! But I just could not take my eyes off the screen. The thump fell heavy against the base of the door. Run! 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 Not a muscle reacted. The chains slid easily across the tile floor behind me. Wake up! Move! My breathing was slow and shallow, my muscles limp and non-responsive. Then thump as it fell onto the carpet at the living room entry. Another thump right behind the couch, right behind me. Barely breathing, my eyes stayed fixed on the snowy picture until I realized that my view was blocked. From nowhere, a man suddenly stood not even 15 feet away in front of the television screen looking straight at me. Even with black lighting, I could tell that he wore a white cotton button-down shirt, a wool business suit of some simple style, if not a bit out of date. Dark leather shoes. I struggled to make out his face. His head tilted over slightly, as if considering a strange species for the first time. Suddenly, he covered the distance between us with one great step or motion or... I can't really tell you how. Just that he was standing in front of the TV in one moment and bending over me, his face inches from my own the next. In that instance, my mind knew him as my grandfather, and his voice was booming inside my head. Anwar, wake from your slumber. An audible gasp escaped as I regained the use of my limbs. I was no longer paralyzed, but where do you run when your decades dead grandfather suddenly shows up, walks through your metal security door, and starts screaming in your face? Fusion held me to the couch. I tried desperately to wake from my dream. All the while, Grandfather followed me with the lifeless, matte black eyes of death. Was that it? Am I about to die? And these are the delusions of my brain, starved of oxygen and struggling to hold on to those last precious seconds of life? I determined that could not be the case. I wouldn't allow it. I slapped my hands against my head, trying to wake from this terrible dream. Be still there, boy. Have you no sense? His command struck a childhood chord. I did as ordered. Also, I was getting a headache, and the self-flagellation wasn't bringing my senses back. I sat there trembling, and I watched the specter sink into my overstuffed chair, cross one leg over the other, and fold his hands comfortably across his lap. Grandson, we need to talk. To talk The word barely squeaked out. Yes, talk. He smoothed his pant leg and picked something from it. Is there lint in the afterlife? You would think they wouldn't have lint there. Well, why me? Why not you? He leaned his head back and gazed at the ceiling above my head. How does that saying go? If not now, then when? If not you, then who? His eyes fell back to mine. A chill went through my body. Grandson, you've heard the family stories. I was quite the businessman in my day. I took advantage of every opportunity. When there was no opportunities, I made them. There's no question that I did quite well, and was compensated quite handsomely for my efforts. Don't you agree? My mind was full of static. How could this be real? Oh, he asked me a question. Well, did he really ask it? Or am I just hearing it in my head? Wait. What was the question again? Huh? Anwar? Pay attention! 
be here now. I'm sorry. How could this not be an hallucination? If I play along, am I making it worse? Giving it more power? I need to take some time off from work. Pay attention, boy. This is important. You need to keep your mind focused. Focused? Maybe there's a medication to take care of this. How will I explain that I've started seeing ghosts? Anwar, really? Be present. You're worrying about the past. You're worrying about the future. You're missing the present. This current moment. Then, thumping his finger into the end table for emphasis, be here now. Uh, sorry, grandfather. Oh, oh, I was there. I just wasn't too sure where there was. As I was saying, I did quite well in my time. But it came at a price. It seems that the universe keeps a score of sorts. And apparently, the universe wasn't too keen on my methods. With that, heavy chains adorned with odd baubles materialized around my grandfather's body. He picked up a smaller trinket in the shape of a dolphin. It seems that the universe didn't appreciate the money saved by ocean dumping. Then a slightly large one, shaped like a tree. And all those acres that we strip mine for good quality coal. And then he picked up one still larger. It looked like an infant. He held it up toward me. Polychlorinated biphenyls. You might know them as PCBs. It seems the universe doesn't have the power industry's appreciation for low-priced capacitors. But Grandfather, you're dead now, aren't you? A big part of me hoped that he was not dead. Grandfather fakes his own death to pursue a dream of becoming the next Houdini I could deal with. But an apparition? Not so much. How can these things harm you now? Indeed, Anwar, I am dead. But the universe has not forgotten my deeds. Instead, I am doomed to visit the outcomes of my decisions for so long as they persist. I just thank God now that I didn't invest in that Chernobyl power plant. He shifted his seat and continued. Now I wander endlessly between scenes of my own consequences. I'm told that will continue until my effects are no longer. On a good day, I'll be forced to watch the last gasps of a fish snared in plastic dumped 50 years ago. Or for the final struggle of a fawn killed by cyanide from that money pit of a gold mine. Then there's the daily visits watching over the lifetime warehousing of a child born with birth defects so severe that the child is little more than a brain stem with enough organs to qualify as a human by society's standards. Or the visits with a family as they watch their loved one wither away from cancer or irreversible liver damage. That sounds horrible. Indeed it is. That's why I've come to you, to spare you my fate. But grandfather, I'm not dumping things in the ocean. I'm not in charge of any factories. What do I have to repent for? As I said, grandson, what I described are what I call the good days. The bad days are far worse. On those days, I'm forced to watch the outcomes of the people that I've hurt and the opportunities. Sadness washed over his face as he winced against a tear. His voice cracked. The human opportunities to help others that I missed. His eyes drifted back to the ceiling, and in a half-dreamy voice he said, In the story, A Christmas Carol, Marley tells Scrooge that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide, and if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. It is doomed to wander through the world. Oh, woe is me, and witness what it cannot share, but might have shared on earth and turned to happiness. He wiped a tear from his face, and his gaze returned to mine. You see, grandson, I never realized how important people are, even those for whom I was merely an employer. Sure, I provided jobs and a steady means of feeding their families, but shame overwhelmed him. I used them like equipment, demanding more productivity without sharing in the increased profits. When times were tight, I cut the people to save the bottom line, when I could have cut the bottom line and saved the people. Defensive now, 
He looked skyward and raised his voice. After all, they must have still been happy. They continued to show up for work each day, right? The chain grew heavier and a new device attached itself. Oh, come on! He looked around at the universe. How was I supposed to know that they had any use for more of the pie? But grandfather, I treat others fairly and with respect. What could I have to repent for? He seemed still distracted, still in conversation with the universe. Then he looked at me with urgency. Grandson, there is still time for you to avoid my fate, but the universe calls me. Apparently, I'm being summoned to watch the death of another creature. I've delegated your instruction to three trusted apparitions who will visit you to show you the way. Grandfather, with all due respect, it's late, and I'm clearly not in the right mind. Listen to me, grandson. Unlike me, there is still time for you. I beg you, pay close attention to those that are yet to come. Not for me, but for your own sake. With that, there was a great clanking of the chains. A swirl of smoke encircled him, and a sorrowful dirge of lamenting voices that consumed him when they drew him through the picture window and dissipated into the night fog. The TV blinked onto a smiling blonde news anchor. She was promoting a local drive through Christmas light display. Charlie, this is one of the largest light displays in the area, with over 40 acres of animated lights. The entry fees are all going to St. Vincent's Homeless Shelter. As you know, Charlie, they work so hard throughout the year to provide food and services to some of our most needy residents. Confused, I used the remote to turn off the TV and sat there in silence. I touched the cup of tea on the end table, in part to see if it was real, and in part to reassure myself that I was real. Still warm. No matter how long the hallucination had seemed, it couldn't have lasted longer than a few minutes in the real world if the tea was still warm. In the real world? What's happening to me if I'm thinking in terms of the real world versus what? Some other world? Some other dimension? Clearly, I haven't had enough sleep lately. Or maybe there's a contamination in my tea leaves. Yes, that's gotta be it. I put the teacup back on the end table. Some tainted tea leaves. I'll throw them out and buy new tomorrow. But for now, the safest thing to do will be to sleep this off. Thanks for listening to episode 190A. Be sure to get your free copy of A Business Carol and share it with a friend. Break the bread and spread it around. Stay tuned for episode 190B, Stave 2. Jacob and I are working on an entire new catalog of episodes for 2018. If there's anything in particular you would like to learn, now is the time to let us know. Just email me, Aaron, A-A-R-O-N, at e6s-methods.com. Until then, have a great holiday and continue to enjoy the rest of 2017. Be present and enjoy it. Cheers.